The incoming Biden administration is a mixed bag so far, but Biden's Obama-style cabinet picks could come at no surprise to the left. Matt Iglesias, he notes, in a new Washington Post op-ed. TC Bureau Chief of Slow Boring and author of One Billion Americans, The Case for Thinking Bigger, Matt Iglesias joins us to discuss how the Biden administration is shaping up. Is that how you style yourself, DC Bureau Chief of Slow Boring? <laughs> well, that was my joke. I'm the only person here. Okay. So. I was, was going like, to say, I'm I pretty love... sure you're the only employee. But um, Actually, yeah. before we, yeah. before I ask you specific yeah. stuff about the Biden administration, just tell people about Slow Boring. You're newly independent. Where That's can right. they subscribe? What are you hoping to accomplish there? Yeah, this is a new newsletter I started. It's slowboring.com. Uh, it's focused on politics and, and policy. A little bit of a return to my my kind of roots as an independent blogger. Um, you know, just trying to give a somewhat different perspective uh, on the political events of the day in a kind of increasingly mm -hmm. partisan and often dull media. Uh, not <laughs> that different from what you guys are doing. <laughs> yeah, well, I am loving it. I'm a subscriber and it's churning out great content every single day. So thank you, Matt. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so, Matt, I guess what we wanted to talk to you here was about the pa the cabinet picks. Um, there's been a lot of consternation about, you know, it, oh, the, you know, from the progressive left and then also just generally about how things are shaping up. Is it Obama 2.0? What is your general consent? What is your general view of where the cabinet picks are? Is Biden maybe leaning a little bit too hard into personality? What do you think? I mean, you know, I think you have to have realistic expectations, right? Yeah. This was Barack Obama's vice president. He campaigned right. very explicitly saying, we're going to bring the good old days back. So, you know, you can't really look at these picks and say, oh, he's he's betrayed his, his promises to America. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that even within that context, there is a kind of extraordinary level of look back to the Obama second term and the picks we've had. Uh, you know, I don't think anyone is that fired up about the agriculture department, but to like take the guy who was agriculture secretary for eight years under Obama and then bring him back into the role rather than saying, you know, there's like somebody somewhere who could get a new shot at this or the closest thing to a real outsider in this group is Janet Yellen, who was Obama's Fed chair, you know, which is, <laughs> you know, she, she wasn't she wasn't like part of the team, you know, like huddled in meetings in the West Wing. But uh, very, you know, uh, Biden knows a lot of people. He's worked with a lot of people in politics and he seems much more interested in assembling a team of people he knows and has worked with personally rather than in expanding the circle or putting new faces forward. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, and I think that's an interesting point because one of the things that he did sort of promise is, oh, I'm going to be the bridge to the mm -hmm. next generation of Democratic leaders. And I was just seeing somebody online making this point, so I don't want to like just totally mm -hmm. disappoint him as my own. <laughs> but essentially, all of the people who have actually been picked so far, they're in like their 60s and 70s. They're definitely throwbacks to the Obama era, Vilsack being like directly plucked for that from that eight years and plugged into the Biden administration. So. In that way, it is contrary to some of the rhetoric about how he was planning to govern. Yeah, I mean, this cabinet is not a next generation of leadership. It is a lot of people in their 60s, not people in their 40s, um, and some people quite a bit older than that. So, uh, you know, that is a, a difference. At the same time, it is oftentimes, you know, people like Tony Blinken, he was deputy secretary of state. Now he's going to bump up uh, to, to be full secretary. But yeah, I mean, the bridge to the extent it exists is Kamala Harris, right? Um, mm -hmm. Who is now the sort of heir apparent is from a younger generation, is assembling a mostly younger team with a kind of very seasoned chief of staff behind her. Uh, you know, we haven't really seen how that that dynamic will play out. I know it's something there's a lot of sort of whispers about, you know, even what's the 2024 situation going to be. Yeah. And Matt, one thing I've always admired kind of about your work is just like the aspiration to actually do something big, as you uh, say in your book. How do you think about your that idea, the you know desire to actually really fundamentally change some of the things we have going on in our country in context of the uh, of these cabinet picks? Like I was reading your newsletter about the mass transit crisis that we're facing, about wealth gaps, about the need in order to go big on stimulus and more. How do you thinking about that in the context of how this is shaping up? So I think the optimistic read of it is that a more moderate cabinet is actually more likely to be able to get something done, mm -hmm. right? This is not, you know, there was a dream world for progressives where they did better in the election. 
And then you would say, OK, the more progressive Biden staff, the bigger his aspirations will be. But mm-hmm. a very left wing group would be a recipe for gridlock here, mm-hmm. whereas a more moderate group might make some deals, might work some things out, might have some creativity. At the same time, a creative group would involve people who haven't necessarily been in Washington uh, for, <laughs> for as long as this team has. So it, it, it's it's promising. I, I could give an optimistic read to it, right, which is this is a pragmatic group of people. This is mm-hmm. a group that's designed to be able to work with Republicans, at least in Biden's mind. That's his aspiration. On the other hand, it is not a lot of big outside voices or sort of new ideas. I mean, I guess I'm kind of struck by the lack of strategy around it really at all. It just seems like, and this was the point Ryan Grimm made on the show, he's like, you know, the identity lens has created this just sort of ideological grab bag where you happen to get a Marsha Fudge who's pretty progressive and then you happen to get a, a, they, you know, use some diversity picks over at the Pentagon in order to be able to get his buddy Tom Vilsack in at Ag Secretary. Like, it seems very much less of, hey, let me put in the right people. I have this vision for how I want the administration to operate. And more like, this is my buddy. I owe this person political chit. I need to check these diversity check boxes rather than any sort of real strategy whatsoever. I would say, you know, as a reporter, that there appears to have not been a lot of alignment between Biden himself and his sort of pre-election transition team. It seems like he had some priorities that he did not communicate all that clearly to them. And that they they had assembled, you know, sort of in pencil, a team that would be very diverse, but that would not put diversity forward in such a public way. Uh, Biden clearly prioritized relationships, you know, historic relationships with him. Uh, more than I think his team had planned. And that wound up creating some weird diversity angles where Mm -hmm. in order to meet their aspirations, you know, so I I think General Austin at at the Defense Department, you know, he's obviously a qualified choice, but it's also transparent (laughs) that his name bubbled up uh, because they were looking to find more roles for African-Americans in the cabinet. At the same time, Democrats actually have a pretty extensive bench of well-qualified Black and Latino uh, contenders for attorney general. But Biden prioritized giving that to Doug Jones, who's also well-qualified, but has a a strong personal relationship with Biden. Uh, But, you know, it means that when you when you create roles for some of these old time Biden pals who tend to be white men and you're committed to having a very diverse cabinet, you wind up squeezed uh, and constrained in certain respects. And this was all very foreseeable and in fact foreseen by people who worked on the transition and they thought they had a plan and then the president elect seemed to have different ideas. Well, and I think it's also very, I think it says a lot about Biden himself who is not particularly ideological and prizes those personal relationships over almost any, I mean, that is his ideology to the extent that he has an ideology. So what do you think that says about how he's ultimately gonna govern? You know, it'll be interesting to see, right? I mean, Biden puts a lot of stock in the idea of pressing the flesh, you know, shaking hands, sitting down with people, seeing what happens. Uh, The challenge for him is gonna be that he's gonna have to try to do that with some newer voices in Congress, right? It's gonna have to be a question of not, can Biden work things out with his old buddies, but can he work something out with Josh Hawley? Can he work Mm -hmm. something out with Marco Rubio? Because the Republicans who are the most creative thinkers tend not to be the ones who Biden served with in the Senate, right? Right, that's true. You know, who knows? It, It may be that nothing is possible. These guys may be intransigent, Democrats may be intransigent, but if there were to be a possibility of creative policymaking, it would involve reaching out to the younger and newer members. And so that that's Biden's style to focus on personal relationships, but it would mean needing to get out of the comfort zone of the people who he has literal relationships from the 1990s. With. I think that's such an excellent point, Matt, which is the people he came up with are actually some of the biggest obstructions. Some of the worst. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. Right. Anyway, man. Um, yeah. Matt, congrats yeah. on the new newsletter, Slow Boring. Yes. Everyone should go to subscribe on Substack. Um, you know, sometimes your analysis makes me completely crazy, but I always read it because I know <laughs> it's going to be super smart and oftentimes challenges my own assumptions, which I really appreciate. So thank you so much, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Coming up, Executive Director at American Compass, Orrin Cass, gives his review of the Trump administration when Rising returns. 